At 11.30 in the morning on November 7, 1943, Feldwebel Hans Vierer Lurch stepped onto the frost-stiffened concrete of Rechen Airfield in northern Germany and approached the captured American fighter that had been towed into the hangar hours earlier. Even from a distance, the machine looked out of place, an intruder in a landscape of slender Messerschmitts and compact Focke-Wolfs. Its shape was broader, its stance heavier, its wings thicker. It seemed almost to crouch, like a heavyweight boxer standing in the middle of a ballet studio. As he drew closer, Hans understood instantly why pilots across the Reich had been talking about it for months. This was the Republic P-47 Thunderbolt, an American fighter unlike anything Germany had ever encountered. He circled the aircraft slowly, boots crunching against gravel, breath curling into the cold November air. The Thunderbolt's sheer size was the first shock. Fully loaded, it weighed more than 7,600 kilograms, nearly double that of a BF-109. Its enormous cowling housed the two-row Pratt and Whitney R 2800 double WASP, a radial engine of astonishing complexity and power. Thick armor plates wrapped the belly and cockpit. The wings bristled with 8.50 caliber Browning machine guns, more firepower than many German bombers carried. As Hans ran his hand along a scarred panel, feeling a deep dent caused by a 20 mm cannon shell that had failed to penetrate, he felt something unsettling. This aircraft was built to be hit. German ground crews, engineers, and intelligence officers gathered around the machine like scientists examining a meteorite. They measured its wings, crawled under its fuselage, and carefully removed panels to study its systems. Every few minutes someone would mutter in disbelief, at the size of the turbocharger, at the thickness of the armor, at the absurdly heavy-duty hydraulic lines. These were not engineering choices Germany would ever make. Luftwaffe designs prioritized speed, agility, and efficiency. But the Americans had built something altogether different, a flying fortress of a fighter. As noon passed, the team brought out the performance reports from the aircraft's brief and chaotic final flight before it crashed. The P-47 had fought three German fighters, survived a catastrophic oil leak, absorbed cannon hits, and still managed a controlled landing. The captured pilot had already been interrogated, but his statements only deepened the mystery. He explained that American training emphasized high-altitude combat, high-speed dives, and energy tactics. He said Thunderbolts routinely fought above 25,000 feet, where German engines struggled. He said the aircraft could dive at speeds German fighters dared not attempt. To Hans, this was more shocking than the physical aircraft itself. The Americans were flying a different kind of war. Throughout the day, the investigation intensified. Luftwaffe test engineers disassembled the turbo supercharger system, marveling at its complexity. Hot exhaust gases were routed through long ducts to the rear of the fuselage, powering a large turbine that rammed compressed air back into the engine. This allowed the P-47 to maintain power at altitudes where air was thin and engines gasped for oxygen. Germany had nothing remotely comparable. Their fighters relied on mechanical superchargers, simpler, lighter, but far less effective at extreme altitudes. The Thunderbolt, criminally heavy at low altitude, became a monster once it climbed above the clouds. By early afternoon, a group of high-ranking Luftwaffe officers gathered in a drafty briefing room overlooking the captured machine. The atmosphere was tense. Sheets of technical sketches lay scattered across the table, annotated with red pencil marks and exclamation points. One officer pointed out that the Americans seemed willing, even eager, to sacrifice agility in exchange for durability and altitude performance. Another argued that the P-47 reflected American industry itself, large, powerful, and capable of producing in absurd quantities. A third warned that if this fighter was being deployed in large numbers, Germany's daylight defenses would soon collapse. 
But the conversation grew even more serious once the officers examined the Thunderbolt's mounting points. It could carry bombs. It could carry rockets. It could carry long-range fuel tanks. It was not merely a fighter, it was a flexible weapons platform capable of roles beyond anything Germany had anticipated. Hans listened quietly in the corner of the room, notebook in hand, realizing for the first time that Germany might not simply be facing a new aircraft, they were facing an entirely new way of thinking about aerial warfare. After the meeting, the engineers prepared the aircraft for a test flight. They refueled it, checked the controls, and made cautious adjustments. Luftwaffe test pilot Hauptmann Dietrich Schuster climbed into the cockpit. Even for an experienced German pilot, the Thunderbolt felt foreign, its cockpit spacious, its controls heavy, its instruments arranged differently. He taxied down the runway, listening to the deep, bellowing roar of the double wasp engine behind its massive propeller. As the throttle opened, the aircraft lunged forward with unexpected vigor. A few seconds later, the P-47 lifted off the ground, an American behemoth flown by a German hand. The first minutes of flight shocked him. The Thunderbolt felt heavy at low speed, but in a dive it transformed. It accelerated at a pace that bordered on terrifying, the airframe stable even as the altimeter spun downward. The aircraft fell like a safe, as one American pilot would later describe it, except the safe was armed with eight machine guns and capable of pulling out at the bottom. Schuster attempted several combat maneuvers and noted the distinct differences from German fighters. Low-altitude turns were sluggish. Climb rate was mediocre. But in high-altitude, high-energy combat, the Thunderbolt would be a nightmare opponent. When he landed, his uniform was soaked with sweat. He reported that German pilots needed to avoid diving pursuits entirely. If a thunderbolt dives away, he warned, let it go. In the following weeks, intelligence reports circulated to every major Luftwaffe unit. Pilots were instructed to attack P-47s only from below or head-on, to avoid vertical maneuvers, and to exploit low-altitude turning fights where German aircraft still held an advantage. But theories soon collided with battlefield reality. By early 1944, P-47s accompanied American heavy bombers deeper into Germany. They attacked German aircraft factories, supply lines, rail yards, and armored divisions. Their ruggedness made them ideal for ground attack missions. They dove into columns of German tanks and vehicles, unleashing bombs and rockets with devastating results and every Thunderbolt shot down was replaced by American factories that produced hundreds more each month. Hans watched these developments with growing dread. On the morning of February 22, 1944, he stood again on the runway at Retchen and saw dozens of smoldering bomb craters left by an American raid. The sky still echoed faintly with the thunder of distant engines. Days later, he received word that entire Luftwaffe squadrons had been shredded by Thunderbolts and Mustangs escorting American bombers. The Reich was losing pilots faster than it could train replacements, and the new American fighters had stripped away Germany's greatest advantage, air superiority. Looking back, Hans realized that the moment he saw the P-47 in that hangar in November had been a turning point. Not because of one aircraft, but because of what it represented. The Thunderbolt was an industrial message written in steel, aluminum, and firepower. It said the Americans would not fight Germany's war, they would fight their own, on their terms, with machines built from a philosophy of overwhelming power and uncompromising durability. The Luftwaffe, once supreme over Europe, was now facing an enemy that could outbuild them, outengineer them, and outlast them. And as snow dusted the wings of the captured Thunderbolt that evening, settling into the bullet dents like white scars, Hans understood what German pilots would soon learn in the skies. The era of German dominance was ending, and the era of the American Thunderbolt had begun.